Okay, so I'm the last person between you and drink, so I'm gonna make this uh, relatively quick. Um, so my name is Paul, I'm at the Knight Foundation, and uh, what I do is I'm a grant maker. So I am not the person who is um, training AI and algorithm. So what is a grant maker? Um, so think of me as your lobbyist um, for really good project ideas for money. So that's what I do, is I lobby on behalf of really great ideas so that they can have money. Um, prior to that, I was at NBC News, at AP, and Miami Herald, so I've been a journalist all my life in the intersection of technology and um, journalism. Um, so today, I'm, just a quick review of what the agenda today. So I'm gonna sort of highlight AI's history in journalism. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, how three different newsrooms had applied AI to the journalism, and then I'm gonna invite you guys to actually do some pro-cons debate based on some of the scenarios that I have planned. Um, so if we could just take a quick look at this story, just read it pretty, you know, it's sort of like a really quick story from the AP. Any thoughts and comments? Is it coherent? Yeah. Does it get you the information that, let's say, if you are the, you know, Ohio State and Northwestern, does that get you the game scores that you need? It sounds like a typical AP story, right? There's no thrill, no thrill, right? Um, guess what? Who do you think wrote this story? A robot. Sort of, like, it's a robot in conjunction with an editor training it. So, um, do anyone know who Makila is? Okay. So, guess how many Instagram followers does she have? So, 1.7, right? So, how many Instagram followers does Sean Hannity have? Everyone has a phone. Just look it up. <laughs> anyone? Sean Hannity, how many Instagram followers does he have? Like 700,000, right? David Muir, 300,000. Anderson Cooper, 1.8 million. So Makila is a 19-year-old Brazilian-American model. She is sort of a musician, an artist, and guess how many followers does she have? 1.7, right? So, she has more following than some of the most popular journalists that we have. Um, what do you think of Makila? Anyone follow her Instagram? Right? Um, do you think Makila is real? Yeah, so this is Makila. Well, um, she isn't. She's an AI influencer. So she doesn't exist. But she has an Instagram with a large following. Um, so this will play out later in our scenario planning. Do you know who Xin Xiaomei is? Right. She's a TV anchor for China, Xinhua Network. She just debuted not too long ago. But she's a TV anchor. I remember seeing this story. Yeah. So guess what? She's also not real. Right? She's actually an AI-generated TV anchor. Well, guess what? AI in journalism is not new, right? It's not like, oh my God, we just discovered this new technology in AI. And in fact, we have been applying AI as far back as 2014 with LA Times QuickBot. So LA Times QuickBot, basically what they use is AI technology um, to basically scan the, um, the um, National um, Geographic Center. So anytime there's a hur there's not hurricane, uh, I'm in Miami, so I'm familiar with hurricanes. In California, every time there's earthquake, it basically auto-generate an alert and come with a story, right? So they start doing that in 2014. At the same time, AP had gone 
from producing 300 business articles to 3,000 business articles per quarter. And in fact, when I was at the AP, I hired our first automation editor, where his job is to really look for opportunities to automate content. And then Washington Post used Heliograph um, in, the, in um, the Olympics. So again, most of the early history of AI and journalism is really about the output, right? It's an output of more content, right? And, but we have gone beyond that, right? So if you look at some of the key examples, in Reuters, they basically used the technology to help journalists figure out what breaking news they should prioritize by using some kind of scoring system. Right, so now they had gone from being output to more about efficiency and expanding capacity for the newsroom. Right, and Washington Post used a knowledge map to help people personalize data. Facebook is using AI to potentially combat fake news. Right, and BBC is using um, AI to sort of surface news that you think that they want. So personalization is getting more important. And you hear from other speakers, you know, like NPR and Quartz, they're using a lot of these technology already. So it's already in our ecosystem and is not completely new. So a couple of case studies. For the AP, recently, they have a growing demand of US sports news, right? And what happened, what's sort of like common in our industry right now in terms of staffing resources? Right, like you're not gonna, even if you're not downsizing, you're just not gonna have enough reporter to cover everything, right? They do have reporter, but they can't cover every single game at every single tournament. There's just not enough resources to send reporters all over the place, right? So that's their challenge. With every challenge, there's always an opportunity, right? And why is this opportunity important, and why do we want to think about technology and this opportunity, right? Because technology could sort of help you mitigate certain inefficiency, right? And it could also help you secure resources and the future of newsroom. So what APC is, there's a growing demand of sports content, right? But they don't have enough resources to sort of front load all of that. But what do you notice about the story that I showed you early on from the AP? Go back and. Yeah. It wasn't structured like a traditional story. Oh, I think I'm too far away from the laptop. So, what is the, what is the basic structure of this story contain? Hmm? Okay, what else? Huh? Data. Okay. What kind of data? Predictable. Structure data, right? Like these are data that you could scrape, right? Just like no one ever, no student ever grow up to say, I'm going to be the best earnings reporter in the world or the best game scoring reporter in the world, right? You want to write a great story. You're not here to say, you know, IBM had made X amount of million this quarter, right? Like, these data are super structure, right? Yet in the old days, someone, someone, a physical person, need to like write the stories, and there's always the same kind of structure. So what APC, what AP did is, based on the structure data, they see an opportunity that they work with the editor and a startup So what they did is they see an opportunity to increase their, their capacity by using natural language generation to write these previews. Now in order for them to do it, they actually have to work with an editor. Right? So an editor and reporter basically have to work with the natural language generator to sort of write these language in the most authentic way possible. And it actually take a long time to sort of help craft and templatize these stories so that you could see how the data get flow in to these type of texts, right? So that's the solution. And then here's the end results. They were able to produce 15 times more content than they did before, 
Yeah, Margaret? Um, when we first did the we in the day now um, with the earnings story, it basically took several months of back and forth, right? And they have to work with an editor, so it's not like the machine just know what to write, right? Because you have to write that in the way that sound like the AP. It feels like it's coming out from the AP, and then you also have to plan for different scenario. Not only do you have to write the story, but you also have to plan for how do you spot check 5,000 stories that's auto-generated, right? What are the systems that you have to put in place to make sure that there's no error, right? And then what this does is free AP up from the human resources now. They're able to just write the best and most complicated games. Right? Because they know the machine could produce the rest. And the other advantages for them is they could now version stories. Right? Why is that important? Right? Because you know, people just doesn't want a traditional text narrative, especially for AP customers. They feed to TV, they feed to you know, text people, and some people just want bullet. So by using the structured data, they're able to version the story in many, many different ways. So the second case study, Wall Street Journal. Here's the challenge, right? Editors doesn't remember everything. They, I know they like to think they know everything, but they really don't know a whole lot of things. Um, as someone who always been on as an editor, um, telling people, here's what I want, and, and, but I, I know the least of things, right? So this is their challenge. So the opportunity of all of these contents that the editors are uh, editing is, how do we help them, oh, sorry. Oops. Clearly I'm not effective with this, so I'm just gonna go old school. Okay, so the opportunity is they want to they want to help the editor to create a way to see these connections between the different stories, right? So again, they're going back to language analysis. In fact, they use something called um, doc to ve D-O-C, the number two, V-E-C. And basically what that do is they look for a cluster of similarity. And based on that, it gives you sort of these vectors, right? So the solution is use this language analysis to help sort of surface the similarity between articles and help give them insight. So the tool they end up using is helping the newsroom be better at their journalism, be, be better at understanding what connects with their customers and what don't. Right? So here's what the results are. They, they actually find these identity clusters. For example, they realize that the college ranking stories and their financial advice stories are very similar that people have in very, you know, two separate departments write these stories, but now they're actually promoting these stories together because what the AI did is surface that, you know, when, when those two stories combine, it's much, much higher engagement. It also helped them realize that um, when they write about how AI transform industry, it has a much higher engagement than when they're just talking about AI and the growth in a particular sector, right? So they're able to use the machine learning to help them understand what is it they're doing and how do they go deeper and produce the content that the audience find highly engaging, right? So this is not just about looking at metrics of what people read and don't read, but what they're doing is finding correlations. And the third case is with Quartz. So this is something that um, Knight have funded, um, the Bot Studios. And um, so they partnered with um, ICIJ on the Mauritius leak um, story. And so what, you know, back in the old days, how would you, how would you do this? Anyone? Right? Like you're basically gonna gouge your eyes out if you, I mean, <laughs> I mean, how many people do you have to deploy to read 200,000 doc documents? There's a lot of people, 
right? And you know how these documents work. It's sort of like a mess, right? It's just like, here's like a pile of documents. Go at it, right? Nothing is structure. So again, what Quartz did is they create a mechanism that journalists could suddenly, um, they, um, they basically train an ML model, a machine learning model, to help journalists sort of surface some of these content. And so the, there's a difference between sort of like doing a search on document versus machine learning. Um, so what they did with the machine learning, I mean, in typical, when you get a document, does all the document come in perfectly neat? Does it have, you know, if you're looking for tax, you know, like tax reform, like does it always have like tax reform? Like does it have all the proper information that you want? No, right? Like sometimes like the page that they scan is like, weird or lopsided or words get cut off, something that might look like a tax reform but it isn't and something that's like an invoice that might look for text. So what, what they end up doing in Quartz is actually training the machine to identify these content. Again, making correlations for this. And then because of that, they're able to, to sort of, the end result was amazing where they were able to analyze 200,000 documents in 13 hours, right? So the, the machine, the ML model basically took about 13 hours to sort of like train and then they went at it. And they produced, because of the insights of what they did with the AI, it, it was able to, they were able to break several dozen stories, right? And they just recently won an EMP award for business journalism. That is pretty crazy. Right, is insights that you normally have to deploy like a whole team of people to do, but now you could train a machine to do it. So here's the fun part. This is me stop talking. Um, I need you guys to self-organize into six different teams. So it's usually probably teams of four or five will work. So just self-organize six different teams so that I could see six cluster. It's okay, I mean, it's a small room, no one bites, so just self-form a cluster. Do we have six clusters? Okay, so here's basically what I want you guys to discuss. So, the Gary Kebo, you guys, how many clusters are you just? We're one, One, okay. Okay, so Gary, your cluster will basically tack on scenario one, okay. but what you're doing is you are pro AI, right? You're gonna use the money to do an AI anchor. And then Margaret, you are cluster two, and you are anti-AI. You say you're not gonna use the money to, to, to fund an AI anchor. You're gonna, you're gonna spend the money to hire a real person, right? So just read this premise and then I'm gonna guide you through these questions. Um, the middle customer, there's only three of you or? Okay, so you guys would tackle scenario two, right? Where you guys are the, you, huh? Oh, two, oh, so, um, scenario, yeah. So you're like anti-AI, pro-AI, so cluster three, you guys gonna tackle scenario two. And your scenario is you are pro using NLP to edit podcasts via synthetic voice. So you say, that's great, I'm, I'm gonna go for it. And then you guys in the middle, you guys are the anti podcast. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Wait, there's only five clusters here. Yeah, I need a six group. Uh, well, you know what? For, for the last cluster, you guys could decide whether you want to. 
So you will, you will decide whether you're going to hire reporters or use AI. OK, so just I'm going to go back to these scenarios. So what I want you guys to think about here is these basic questions in the scenarios. Right? What is the challenge and opportunity here? What are the potential risks? Right? So it could be reputational, it could be operational, or it could be um, financial. Right? So whatever scenario you are, whether it's a pro or con, think about what are the risks. Right? What are some of the ethical questions that you might need to address for using or not using the technology? And how will you quantify success? And also think about what questions we should be asking that we're currently not asking. Right? So the reason we're going to go through this exercise is sort of to, to go through the mindset of, you know, at the AP, the journal, and Quarks, right? When they're thinking about using this technology, they have to think about what is the opportunity here, right? At the end of this, what would quantify success? And are there any ethical concerns? So I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes to discuss, and then I'm going to have you guys sort of present your findings. Okay, so your 10 minutes starts now. You guys okay. can't see me back there. Okay, so your scenario is you have, you're a local TV station owner, right? And, um, and you have a little bit of investment, right? Because local TV is also under pressure. And you have some money. And, and the money for next year, you have $400,000, right? So you have a choice. You need, you're in desperate need of a primetime anchor. Right? But they're costly. They're, they're $250,000 like, a year. And you know, you know how anchors are, right? They could be cranky. They have personalities. At, at times, they could be diva-ish, right? So, and, but you could also hire some reporters. But ha ha, but now you see what China did. You're like, hmm, could I do that? If, a bill, if it's good enough for a billion people in China, is it good enough for my local DM? you know, local demographic here in the Chicago area. So, go. Okay. So, like he said, you guys, we have a $400,000 budget, right? I can either spend it and get, you know, one anchor and one reporter and have a couple left over. Or, you know, we could get an AI, which is a real person. Yeah, are they really going to know? Who knows? It depends if we decide to tell them or not. So let's go ahead and get the cons out of the way. I know um, it can mess up the trust of the general public, right? Oh, that's a robot. It's not a real person. Are they really speaking English? Is it true? We tell them that it is. Uh, can they spit out wrong information? Yes, but last time I checked, Steve Harvey announced the wrong pageant queen. So it's fine. We can fix it. Um, it is attractive to hackers. That's one of the biggest things we thought about. You know, hackers can definitely hack an AI. What do you do? Find a way not to have it connected to the internet. What are hackers' biggest thing? The internet. So, you know, we have people in the back that you guys don't know about that know how to program that, so we'll be good to go. Um, does it give emotion? Probably not at first, but, you know, if I can program, you know, if Disney can program a lion to cry, I'm pretty sure we can program an AI to cry on TV. You know, I'm pretty sure I can make them smile, I can make them make you feel loved long enough for you to get the news out that we need you to get out and for us not to have to pay it a lot of money once a, you know, once a year or one time period. So lastly, um, there could be some cultural resistance, right? Oh my God, I'm going to lose my job. What am I going to do? Well, we have other things we need people to do. We need somebody to hold the camera, right? Um, so we need somebody to go back there and edit it. So let's get all that bad stuff that you're terrified about, board, you know, board members, and let's just talk about the reason we need to buy an AI, right? So we have extra money. If we need to adjust it, one time fee, $250,000. It breaks when you spend 10 grand to fix it. We got it. Um, one of the things is broadcast news whenever, however, anywhere, in any language. Can you really do that right now? Might take you a couple hours or a day or two to do that. Yep, so we can, we can get this in just about any language. No AHR liability. We don't have to hear about a sex case coming on the news because they didn't touch anyone. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> we can get more stories out just as quickly. You know, if there's a hurricane in Miami, we get to put an AI in Miami in the middle of the hurricane and they can't die. It's perfect. So we get to know everything that's happening. Quick news. Um, again, 
You can have also, if everyone's worried about there being no human person losing your job, of course we're gonna have a co-anchor. It's not just one person, it's two. So you got the AI, you got the co-anchor. There's your human, there's your emotions. There you know, it's the truth. You're good to go. And last but not least, um, well, it's an AI. It's, it's cheaper. Come on guys, we always wanna save money. <laughs> All right. Okay, so at the very core, journalism is a human-to-human -human interaction. Can you really write off trust that easily? Um, should robots be telling human stories? Journalism involves compassion. It involves authenticity. How much can you program like algorithms to do that all this at the same time? Um, also, can like an AI anchor be the host for Toys for Tots? Can it? I don't know. I don't think everybody would maybe agree on that. Um, and the anchor is the face of the community. Do you want the, the face of human people, the community, to be a robot? Human touch is so important to local TV. Um, and in the area of fake news and false information, people trust people. Um, and then there's also reputation management that comes along with that. Also, uh, number two, cost. Is it really a fixed one-time cost uh, of $2,500? Twenty-five. Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty. Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm not good in math. Um, but uh, there's upkeep that comes with technology, and while anchors come with producers, um, AI comes with like technological support upkeep. So, is that really a realistic cost to uh, keep in mind? Which is maybe one of the questions that we should be asking. Um, adaptability. Humans are adaptable. That's why we're still here. Um, that's why you know dinosaurs are not. Um, can the AI anchor do an interview with you know Donald Trump, who comes to your interview or comes to your uh, town that week, um, or does it have to read off like a script? Um, an AI is programmed with data that already exists, like data sets that we've programmed into it. It's always one step behind. Um, unprecedented news phenomena like hurricanes and natural disasters. Um, that's, that's a human thing, that's what we do. And how competitive can it really be um, if everybody's having access to AI? Like, after a while of just seeing robots on your screen, the human touch that comes along with that, don't you want that novelty of like, a human is telling me this. They know what they're talking about. They have, um, they're not an algorithm that's giving me my news. Um, something else to keep in mind is maybe this isn't the best use of AI technology. Maybe there's other news reports that we could be doing instead. Like, um, uh, they talked about financial news reporting um, and how stocks and um, those things, maybe that's a better use of AI technology rather Great. than anchors. Okay. Thank you. Um, for everyone who's listening to it, like, which, do you, which team make a more compelling argument for you? Just by show of hand, who, who's for AI anchor? No, not you guys don't count. <laughs> So everyone else is not? But who's for AI Anchor? Just one? One? OK, who's not for AI Anchor? OK. So, um, so since you represent, you get an extra train ticket. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's funny, because what I didn't hear, um, so one thing I did, I made the nuance of anchor and reporters, right? You know, like, there's a way to think about a scenario where maybe the anchor is the one who's sort of like telling the news from the studio. And by having that, you could actually have maybe more reporters, which is the human, out at the community, right? So maybe there's like a way to think about those relationships. OK, um, so this team is. They are helping their company scale the podcasting strategy. And they have many, many ambitious podcasts that they want to do. And, you know, editing podcasting, <laughs> we recording audio is very laborious. And, and, but, oh my God, they just find this startup, which actually exists. There's a startup that does that. Um, and so your decision is you're going to go all in, right? Gosh. Yeah, um, go. oh. oh, gosh. Uh. All right, hold on. Sorry. Can't go without my notes. All right. So yeah, so we're going to scale. I'm going to just keep my eyes over here so when I know that I'm wrong, I'll make sure that I remember what we talked about. Um, sorry. 
Um, so yeah, so we're going to scale pod, a podcast strategy for, yes, we call them our neutral stories because we feel like um, our reputation rests on reporting those emotional stories and making sure that we get those scripts right. So what we want to do is we want to um, use it for our main news, let's say car accident, or we have another typical event that we have. Um, we can also do our other podcasts that we want to do, and uh, we want to write scripts for those. And then what we're going to do for the business side is um, when we have sponsors that um, all of us who listen to podcasts know of all of those typical sponsors that we see all the time. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so we'll have those, and then um, we'll have our anchor read those, and then we'll write in our script when we need to insert those, and then our editing machine will insert those when needed. Um, and then it will clean up all the ums, which I'm saying now, so that's fine. Um, but our goal is to get speed and accuracy, um, and then we're going to use all of the budget and people that we were, the manpower that we needed on, uh, on the podcast to work on other things that we need to, or maybe make more podcasts or spin up more podcasts a lot faster than we would if we were um, working on an individual podcast at a time. What are some of the risks you guys assess and how will you mitigate them? Um, I think the risk you mentioned was ethic ethically. Um, like what's the utility of um, us kind of using it for an emotional story? So that's why we thought if we're putting a lot of thought into our stories emotionally, um, or especially like our hard-hitting investigations, we wouldn't want to have an, a natural language processing kind of take that or maybe spin something up. Um, we can always have it clean up all the ums that I say. Like I already mentioned that joke already. Um, but, uh, but I think one of the things we talked about was giving some kind of disclaimer where we say that this has been powered by a particular service that we can then give a nice name to. That sounds friendly and doesn't sound uh, like we're hurting anybody. Okay, thank you. So in this team, you guys are like, no way. I'm like, I don't need, I don't, I'm not gonna use any tools for this. Yeah, true to form, wrote all my notes on a piece of paper on my computer. <laughs> it's very retro. Yeah. Um, so the basic of our the basic thesis for the anti AI, I mean, you know, for us is like podcasting is a new, extremely exciting art form. We think to have to hand that over to AI to iterate podcasts at a mass rate would be the death of the art form. Right out, right off, right out the gate. Um, we've seen it happen with so many different, really exciting, you know, sort of developments that happen in media and entertainment. You get one breakthrough, you get an Anthony Bourdain, and then you turn around and put Gordon Ramsay in the situation. You know, when you start to just iterate on a form like that without having a true creative spark behind it, you know, you start to lose, lose the soul of the thing. We also feel, you know, if you had an AI producing this stuff, AI hosting these things, you limit the different kinds of interactions you can have with the talent or with the subjects you're trying to interview. How can you, you know, you would sort of limit your ability for your, you know, for someone to be able to see your reporter, then interact with the source, you know, have a conversation as they're feeling each other out. But that, you know, you sort of now just have it like a script reader straight, you know, straight to, to the thing. And then, you know, it's that connection because we, we feel like there, we're starting to develop podcast personalities. You know, next time Sarah Canning comes out with a podcast, people are going to be tuning in. We want to be investing in finding our Sarah Canning, which whatever she comes up with, people are going to flock to. You know, we don't feel like an AI is going to generate that same sort of star power and generate the same sort of, you know, this the creative mind that we want people to be drawn to. Um, we're hesitant also that it would edit in a way that feels you know, mechanical, doesn't feel like a conversation. That's what podcasts I feel like is refreshing about that. You know, you break from the traditional media narrative, which is extremely just straightforward. I'm reading you the news, they get to the ending beat. You know, this is, you know, NPR at eight o'clock. Like I think what's, what was innovative and you know, revolutionary about the podcast is it suddenly feels so much more immersive. It's almost like just a step back to like, you know, to theater almost in a way. Um, we wanna make sure that like, you know, the podcasts that we're creating are tapped into that and don't feel you know, in that sort of mechanical way. And I mean, you know, we're just not convinced that, that AI can truly create something, you know, innovative. It's always like, you know, one of the other groups mentioned it, it's adaptive creativity. It's based off of an existing data set. And, you know, the slight variations that it can make off of that based on the new information it's receiving, but whether or not it can truly create the next serial for us, 
Um, we're not convinced. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, which side made a better argument for you guys? To use or not to use? To use it? Well, who, who want to use because... Okay. Okay. Who, who... No, you guys don't get to vote. <laughs> uh, who's arguing that we shouldn't use it? Four, five, six. Okay, so I guess the people who... Two, that's like two losses for the AI. Okay, <laughs> you get a train, extra train ticket. <laughs> okay, so the last group, you guys had an easy choice because you, you're not arguing against anybody. You, you're actually here to make a decision of how you want to spend the money. You say it's easier. We disagree because we had to have the internal turmoil. So ours was... Um, you have $150,000, do you spend it on, oh, there's a potential for increased revenue if you publish high school sports scores. Um, and so do you take that 150000 hire two reporters to do that, or do you uh, spend it on AI? Um, we came up with a lot of kind of soft-shoed compromises that we really like, uh, but some of the things we discussed, um, because before we got clarification. We said, is this in a small rural market or is it in a, in a big suburban or, or urban market? That would be a big uh, um, uh, um, consideration, not only because could you physically cover 100 or 200 uh, high schools with two reporters? Not well. Um, but if it were you know, the Rantoul market, yeah, we could do that with two reporters, right? Because it's a small uh, community. So that was one factor. On the flip side, uh, what's, the, what's the PR of a small com community hiring a computer versus hiring two reporters, right? The, the, there's, uh, there's a public face. I can still remember the high school reporter uh, who covered my soccer games, right, 20 years ago. So that, you know, that's really, you know, there's, there's that face piece that is really compelling. Um, what we... Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions still. How much revenue would, uh, would come out of it? Uh, because... Would hiring the AI uh, give us $150,000 in revenue? Could we, could we hire it and then next year hire a reporter or two with that added revenue? There, is there an argument there? Um, in the end, we kind of came up with kind of a, a balance of could we hire one reporter and, one, uh, and, and do some sort of modified situation where we hire somebody to help manage the AI and, and do some reporting on the side. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we were kind of leaning more AI than not um, in our conversations. So that's kind of where we landed. Okay. Does Great. that track? Yeah. Okay. Um, here's the extra drink ticket for you. Um, Which half of me wins this? I don't know. So thank you for participating in this very oversimplification of an exercise. Um, what I want to make a point in here is saying basically right now as an industry we don't have a framework to discuss this we don't and we are letting the technologists and the platform people decide right so big companies like NPR and, and AP and Quartz obviously they're having these internal discussions but we don't really but as a as a field we actually are responding to what the technology could do rather than come up ahead, right? So when we think about some of these things, you know, the technology is sort of like, when you think back about Photoshop, right? Like as a photographer, think about when Photoshop first got introduced, you know, like the same questions that we face. Is this photo manipulation or not, right? And I'm sure at that moment, it was hotly debated. And then at some point, it got adopted, and then we figured a policy around it. But with new emerging technology, especially different applications of AI from machine learning to natural language processing, we as an industry do not have this framework and is not black and white, right? As this sort of, the reason I sort of separate out, you know, the pro and con is, it's not as easy decisions as you think it is, right? Because in this economy, you have to balance out the ethics, the quality, and the efficiency of journalism, right? So where does technology like AI come in in your day-to-day decision-making, 
right? So, so this is actually my plea for all of us to go back and really think about these conversations and have the conversation. What is the framework in your newsroom or in what you do about an emergent technology, right? Rather than saying yes or no, we shouldn't use it, we, you know, what is your system, what is your process of having this discussion to come to a conclusion saying that should we apply this? If so, how do we apply this ethically and, and sensibly and, and where um, we're not misleading our audience? Yeah, Margaret? Are these related to the conversations that Facebook is now forced to have? True, in some, but think about... I just wondered if this is pretty much... These are the conversations Facebook is now having to have because those ethical issues and those, the other things have caught up with the technology. Yeah, but we, in the journalism field, we are basically holding Facebook accountable, but we're not having that conversation ourselves. Right? Like, are we going to create a monster? Like, I mean, it's easy to point to what China did and say that's unethical, right? Because China is China, but you know, the minute we do it here, then suddenly it's not so, you know, maybe it's fine in some scenario. But again, it's just really about we as an industry have to be better at thinking about developing ethical frameworks and also developing processes to ask ourselves how a new piece of technology get impacted into the work that we are doing. So at night, the reason I'm talking about this, because at night I'm spending a lot of time thinking about the impact of AI and journalism. So in terms of what I might be doing next year, a lot of what my resources in my portfolio is really to answer these questions. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And what are the ethical frameworks um, that we have? Because I don't think as an industry we are having this conversation robustly, we are doing it in silo, and we need to sort of convene not just the journalists, but the journalists with the academics, with the technologists, so that we could come to a common universal understanding of what this technology's implication is to our community's information need. So thank you. If you guys have questions, I'm here tomorrow too. Feel free to ask me.